Okay, inshallah, you guys can hear me. Hold on for a second. Let me set it up on my other computer. Y'all know I'm working so many programs. Just be patient. <laughs> Look at the waterfalls behind me. <laughs> By the way, guys, this waterfall is in my, um, it's where I live at. I live in Cuyahoga Falls, waterfalls like this where I live. <laughs> I took a picture. I took this video this summer. This is uh, the video I took of the waterfall not far from where my house is. And I like to look at it when I get anxiety. It kind of, you know, soothes my anxiety. So y'all take a look at my waterfall. In fact, let me put my screen down for a minute. Y'all look at the waterfall. <laughs> I got to log in on this other computer. And I don't think there's anybody here on, you know what, guys, I don't think I have anybody listening in the Zoom room because they haven't told me that they can't hear me. And since they pretending that they hear when they we not, hear, I hear you on YouTube, Sister Layla, but oh. you're just not in the Zoom. Yeah, I, I didn't turn the sound on. I was going to say, I ain't going to turn it on since they ain't listening. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me get this set up, though, seriously. Let me log in on... Um, Oh, uh, for you guys, I'll use, okay, that's the Instagram again. No, let me log in and keep my eye on Trovo. I'm going to use Trovo with you guys on uh, Zoom so I can keep my eye because they told me that there'd be some people coming on there with Fitna. Okay, so let me. Oh, let me turn my camera on too so they can see me. Let me get the Trovo people going. Uh, Trovo. No, not Trava. I got the wrong thing. Hold on. That sister told me to log in on Trovo and check them out because some people be coming in that room. I, uh, hold on. Let me log into my... Uh, Where's my, um... okay, there's Layla Nashiba. Where's my space? Where's my channel? I haven't logged in on Trovo in so long. I'm sorry, guys. I can't remember how to do it. Oh, there it is. Soon of followers. That's me. Start watching. Oh, there we are. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys on YouTube, I mean on Zoom, take a look at Trovo when I go. Okay. Hold on. So I can keep my eye on them. Okay, and you said they don't have sound in Zoom, although ain't nobody told me but Mina. She's the only one that listens to my classes anyway. She'll keep it mute. Okay, hold on to me. No, we can't hear you in Zoom. Okay, now I turned it on. Yeah, I hear you now. Yeah, I should just leave it off. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, everybody's ready? Oh, I'm sorry. Share it to the... I'm telling y'all, I don't know anybody on more channels than I'm on and don't have no subscribers. That's what's so funny. I'm on more platforms than anybody I know. And I have zero subscribers, hardly. That shows the truth will not set you free. It'll set you free in the hereafter, but not in this life. You will always have one follower in this life. But inshallah, you'll be with, standing with the, the prophet and all them thousands of companions in the day of judgment. Because I ain't got no followers and ain't nobody logged in like Layla. Okay, hold on. Let's get started here. Oh, I'm sorry. Here I come now, Facebook. I got my eye on Trovo. What I'll do each day to keep my eye on these different platforms, I'll pick one like I did uh, Instagram early. This is Trovo. Tomorrow I'll log in on um, Twitter. Then I'll do Twitch. Then I'll do LinkedIn just to see what's going on. So my eyes will be on the fitna because you know, I can't be in a hundred places at once. I know y'all think I'm superwoman, but I'm, I may be Wonder Woman, but I ain't superwoman. Hello. 
pretty good Layla. Okay, let me log in on Facebook. My polygamites, here I come. The polygamy sisters, they're texting me that they can't see me in the group. Here I come. Then they done changed how we do stuff here. There you go, sisters. Hear all them groups I'm in, guys? All the groups, and they ain't got no subscribers and no donations. <laughs> you tell me how that works. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, brother. And, my, and look how many groups I'm on in Facebook. It's pathetic, and we don't have that many um, subscribers or donators. I mean, but that's the life of the people of the truth. We'll never be famous, which we don't want fame. We're not doing it for fame in this world. I want to be famous on the day of judgment. I want to walk a when I when my face is seen on the day of judgment, I want to stand in ovation. A standing ovation from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those companions. That's all, you know, but it's a shame, you know, because the money would help pay for this website expenses. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here broke like I am. I can't even go get my hair done. Can't even go get my hair done because I'm afraid to spend that money because we don't have no donations. I'm like the money I spent on my hair could have been something. And that's a shame. Y'all know I get my hair done every two weeks. I ain't been in about four weeks. So you can imagine how brittle my stuff then got. It's limp and oily. I don't like limp or nothing limp and nothing oily. Hello? Oh, my God. Here we go with the polygamites. Another question from the polygamites before we get started. Let's look at this question, guys. The polygamites. <laughs> They asked a real strange question today. They wanted to know if a bro has two wives and he's impotent, should she stay? That's a question that only she can answer. Can she be married and not have sex? That's not a religious question. That's a personal question. Okay? So... Tell her if she wants to give up sex and if she won't, if she can, can resist committing adultery, that's her business. Because some things are not Islamic, they're just common sense questions. Some women can stay married to a man who can't do nothing for them. There's a lot of women that marry men that don't provide, that don't maintain. There's a lot of women that settle to be on welfare and live in the projects just to have a man. There are some women that's married to a man and the man lives overseas and she ain't seen him in 15, 20 years. So that's up to her. Because in Islam, divorce is good and clean. In Islam, we can get divorced. Divorce is good and clean. And it's always an option. Divorce is always an option if you're in a marriage that you can't deal with. So tell whoever that those sisters are, that's not an Islamic question. That's a personal question. Me personally, I couldn't deal with no limp man. I'm sorry. That's me personally. If I wanted to be with a man that can't take care of me, then I would have stayed by myself. That's me. If y'all see Layla getting married, it's because Layla getting ready to take care of business. That's me, okay? But some women will settle for that. All they want is to say they have a husband. So they'll sit there and climb the walls just to say they got a husband. So tell those sister that's a personal choice. That's a question a woman needs to ask herself, not share it on the internet with others. 
Because if you were married to a man that's impotent, I don't think you want nobody to know, even though the female companions didn't play. We're going to talk about one of those companions today. We have a wonderful hadith where a woman came to the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she said, oh, prophet of Allah, so-and-so is impotent. And the prophet was sitting with several other companions. You know, like I told you, Arab women don't have no, um, they don't bite their tongue. This sister just came and said, so-and-so, my husband is impotent. She said he cannot perform. The prophet said, do you want me to divorce you from him? She said, yes. Because I can't live that way. So again, you know, that's a personal choice. If you, I, I couldn't live that way either. I'd rather be by myself. You understand the sister who asked that question? Y'all, do you understand? So you tell them sisters that that's personal. If the woman is willing to give up sex and, and if she don't, don't feel the need to commit adultery, and then she can stay with him. But if she needs sex in her life, she can divorce him in a heartbeat, just like that female did, that companion did. And he was a good brother. By the way, her husband, she was married to a very, very eminent companion who was highly respected, but the battle, the fighting got to them. And I'm gonna talk about that for a minute because we're gonna go over the story of a female companion today who's a, who was a warrior. You know, all that fighting, death, seeing death, this is nothing pleasant. And killing and stuff, it takes its toll on you psychologically. And that's what happened to this companion, this male companion. He just couldn't perform sexually anymore because his mind was just so caught up. And his wife was young and she couldn't deal with it. She just told the prophet, I can't deal with that. You know, I got married to procreate. Brother man is having a problem. He has nightmares. And he's a good brother. He fulfills his obligations, but that's one he can't fulfill that I need fulfilled. So the prophet gave her her divorce. So there's your Dalil. There's your Dalil that yes, you can do that if you want. But I want you sisters to know that's a personal choice. Some women can, can handle that. Some women can't. Everybody understand the answer? I tell you, my polygamites, <laughs> they always got these questions and they good questions, you know, not hard to answer, just strange. Okay, that's all the questions for right now, right? So I'm gonna get started. Okay, that's it. You, she got her answer. Is the sister good to go? Okay, tell any other questions she got, bring them here. We'll talk about it. Layla ain't got a problem talking about it. Let's talk about sex, baby. Well, ain't that a song, Tiba? Salt and pepper. Let's talk about it. I mean, that's part of the religion. That's part of the religion, too. There's no shyness when it comes to the dean, guys. I don't have a problem answering questions like that. Let's talk about it. <laughs> talk is cheap. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, let's get started. This is serious now. Yeah, I got to keep humor. <laughs> One of the sisters say, Layla, you are funny. Yeah, I got to keep it humorous, guys. These questions get kind of intense. We got to have some humor. Cause it gets intense in here, <laughs> okay? All right, let me get it together for this. This is a good companion I'm getting ready to do, so give me a second. Gotta change this. Let's talk about it. <laughs> By the way, don't y'all forget that Islam Q&A is Friday. 
Y'all got a topic? Let's talk about it. We can talk about that too. Okay. Okay, hold on. Ready? Three, two, one. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to our series entitled Heroines of Islam. The Heroines of Islam. And of all the series that I personally teach, this is the most provocative of them all. It takes a lot to go over the story of these female companions because these female companions are the role models for each and every one of us Muslim women because they are our examples. There is nothing that we encounter in this world today that these women have not already encountered. Even the question that was asked before class about impotency. And I wanna talk about that for a moment. I want everyone to understand that when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rose up to prophethood, this was during one of the most uh, uh, tumultuous times in humans history. These were the dark ages. This was the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth century. This is when the earth was at its, its worst. That's why it's called the medieval dark ages. Christianity had come and gone, left the people wanting. Judaism came and gone way before that. These were days in which the people had lost their hope. They've lost direction. The world was filled with nothing but pillage. It was all about power. It was all about taking over, uh, uh, taking away from those who were less than you. And women, women had no rights during those days. The sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth century, women had no rights whatsoever. So these were terrible times in man's history. And I tell you sisters all the time, to be a woman during the sixth, seventh, eighth century, you had to know how to survive because women were viewed as nothing but property. The world was nothing but pillage and take from who you can take from. Women were the collateral and so were children. If a town raided another town, whoever was the victor not only received possession of everything in the town, but the women and children too. The women and children who survived were divided up amongst the men. They were taken by the men as slaves. You had to be beautiful back then. If you were not a beautiful woman, or if you were an old woman, you were executed. They would just kill you because there was no purpose for you. But if you were young and beautiful, you would be sold into slavery. You'd either be a woman who they prostitute for money, whether you liked it or not, or you'd be a man's bed mate, a slave to a man, his concubine, his bad mate. And the same with the children, believe it or not. The children would be sold into slavery too. If it was a strong boy, he'd be a slave. He'd be work as, worked as a slave. If it was a girl, she'd be given away to be prostituted, to be somebody's bed chambermaid. They called them chambermaids back then. 
That's what the, the prostitute, the women who were kept as the war booty, they were chambermaids. Okay. So these were horrific times for women. So for those people who lived during those centuries, the, the sixth, seventh and eighth century, many of them, if they gave birth to a girl, they would kill her, bury the baby alive. This was done by everyone, not just Arabs, the Vikings. They would take the girl and throw her off a cliff a girl baby and throw her off the cliff. The Romans would smash her head up against a cliff. The Persians stick a spear right through her. Because again, women were of no value back in those, that, those centuries. Okay? So to survive, you had to know how to fight. So if a family, if a couple gave birth to a girl baby and they wanted to keep her, they would train her. She was trained to fight. The Vikings trained their daughters to fight as soon as they could walk. The Romans trained their daughters to fight as soon as they could walk. The Greeks the Arabs, the Persians, even the Europeans who existed then, they trained their daughters to fight. Because that was the time back then. If she couldn't fight, she'd be lost. And also another thing that's important, and I'm setting the pace because you guys are going to see <clears throat> a lot of people listen to my lectures <clears throat> and some people have the nerve to say, Layla, making it up when I ain't making up nothing. Just because you've never been taught the truth doesn't mean that the truth is a lie because all the hadiths I use come from out of Bukhari. It's all right there in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. All you got to do is learn how to read and ask Allah to give you reading comprehension skills. It's not my fault that all the hadiths about women have been skipped over by many of your teachers because they don't want you to see how strong the Arabic women were. They don't want you to know how resilient the women were. They do not want you to know that the women were on the battlefield with the men. They were not at home making babies and having babies because people didn't even live to see the age of 30 back then. Life was short. And being conquered by a stronger tribe happened all the time. So they took each day, day by day, and they thanked Allah for another day, but they never stopped training and preparing themselves for the unexpected war that could come at any time. So it's not my fault that when you guys learned your religion, all the hadiths that speak about women were skipped over. That's why you got to find a good teacher who ain't going to just teach you what he wants you to know. But a sit down and go through those hadith books telling you what you need to know. Okay. So women back in the 6th, 7th and 8th century, if a female child was allowed to live, she was trained to take care of herself. Some of the, and the ones that couldn't be trained, you'll find this out, especially with the European women, for the women that couldn't be trained because they were just didn't catch on to it, they didn't have the heart for it, they became masters in poison. Did y'all know that? Masters of poison. 
That's a lot of European history. The princesses, the queens walked around with poison on them so that should an attack break out, they could poison, slip poison into the drink of their captor. And in many cases, the women would drink the poison themselves because many queens and princesses said they'd rather die than be a slave. The same with the Arab women. For those women that couldn't fight, but there weren't that many because all Arab women were trained. It was just their culture. When I did the story of Sada, Sada, ready Allahu Anha, was 60 years old, but what did, sh sh did Aisha say? Aisha said Sada put everybody to shame on that battlefield. Sada would pick up a, a sword and a pole and it would put everybody to shame. That Hadith is Bukhari. I don't know where y'all get this stuff thinking that these companions didn't fight, that the women weren't fighting. Yes, they helped on the battlefield with water and nursing, but they also fought. That came with it. Because I'd rather die fighting with my sword than to end up a slave to someone and passed around and prostituted. I would have made the same choice too. If I were living back in those days, I'd be the same way. Hand me that sword, hand me a knife. I'd go out that way than be somebody's bed maid or chamber maid as they called it back then. That's history. Well, today I'm going to give you guys the story of one of the best heroines of Islam. She was the sister of one of the best warriors of the Quraysh. She was also the aunt of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen and I want you guys to take notes. And we're going to put to rest this misconception that many of you have that the women were sitting at home somewhere. I don't know where this comes from. And the Arabic sisters here, they tell me, Lalo, I can't believe the women in the West believe that stuff. You know, I have a lot of Arabic women uh, who come and listen to my classes. They help me with some of this stuff. And they're, and they're shocked at how the Muslim women in the West are not taught these things. You know, Supana Allah. So let's share this, but let me first screen share. And by the way, for those of you, oh, I'm not the, I'm not, wait a minute, hold on guys. Who's the host? Me? Okay, hold on. Hold on guys, let me do this. I have to give myself access which I don't know how to do because I can't open this up. Give me a second. Where's Layla's other account? Okay. All right, hold on. It's me. Okay, here I go now. Let's try this again. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay. So the people here in Zoom, you guys are gonna see, this is Trovo. So you guys can watch through Trovo so I can keep my eye on what's going on in there because they say a lot of crazy stuff. That's Trovo, for anybody that's on Trovo, that way I can see what's going on since y'all say it's some crazy people coming in there, okay? And now for everybody here, the rest of you, watch the waterfall. While I put the PowerPoint up and we'll get started now. Allow. Yes, do take it off, Sister Lena. What? What take what? Oh, what's on me? Let me. Let me uh, the Sunnah Fathers at the top and then bottom. Okay, well, let me log on first because I can't do but one thing. Let's see. Where am I at? I'm here. I don't want to get confused. Hold on. 
Okay, let me make this lot big screen for everybody. Wait a minute. Okay, that's large screen. And uh, where's the design? All right. Okay, everybody, inshallah, can see my PowerPoint and Trovo people. I see you guys too. I got my eye on you, Trove. What's this? I don't know what that is, but it's in my way. Okay. All right, let's go to the beginning. Put it on slideshow from the beginning. Okay, everybody can see. So tonight we're going to do the story of one of the great heroines of Islam. Her name was Sophia. Sophia, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. Sophia, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, ready Allahu on her. Let's talk about her. She was the mother of Azubair ibn el Awan, who was one of the eminent companions. And she was the sister of Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad. So she was the Prophet Muhammad's aunt, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, uh, they say that she was the only aunt from his father's side who converted to Islam and migrated. And just like I did the story yesterday of Aisha, ready Allahu on her mother, Um Ruman, a lot of the Arabic girls were trained to be excellent horsewomen, okay? And they were always trained at birth to be warriors because again, the Arabs were no different than the Vikings. They were a warrior race of people. And if you just, they decided to keep a girl alive, she had to know how to defend herself in case the tribe was attacked and she wouldn't end up, you know, somebody's uh, a bed slave. So when Hamza was trained, cause Hamza was her brother, they trained her with him. She was his sister, just as Hamza, was an excellent warrior and swordsman. And Hamza was also an excellent horseman. So was she. She could command a horse and she could wield a sword. And just like her brother Hamza, she had a strong personality. She, many people, men and women, were intimidated by her because she her, her character was strong. She didn't fear nobody. So a lot of people thought she was mean and harsh because she spoke with such authority. Remember, I told you back in those days, the women had to flaunt their authority if they came from a noble family. She came from a noble family. She had to let them know, I am just as good as Hamza. So she carried herself with authority. Just like Khadijah, ready Allah who on her did. Remember, we talked about Khadijah, the mother of the believers. Khadijah came from a noble family too. Khadijah carried herself with dignity, nobility. She was a force to be reckoned with, and so was Sophia. I don't make this stuff up, guys. This is how a woman survived back then. You couldn't survive unless you were strong. Okay. When Sophia was young, she was promised in marriage to a man named El Hadrith ibn Umayyah. That name should be familiar to you. Remember back in those days, if you came from a noble family, the girls were promised in marriage at birth to other dignified men. Well, she was promised in marriage to El Hadrat ibn Umayyah. Who was he? He was Abu Sufyan's brother. She married him, but he died before they could have any children. And like I told you, women didn't remain single back then. Even though she was a woman of affluence, 
A woman still was nothing without a man behind her. So, and being that she came from a noble tribe, she was married quickly to El Awam Ibn Kuwailit. That name should be familiar. Who was he? He was the brother of Khadijah, ready Allahu anha. So now do y'all see? We talked yesterday about how Aisha's mother, Um Ruman, was good friends with Khadijah. Well, now you can see Sophia was close friends with her too. Because again, uh, Khadijah, her, her brother was the husband. The husband of Sophia. And Sophia had two children by him. Asaib As and Azubair. You guys know about Azubair. But he didn't live long either. He died. But after he died, Sophia devoted all her attention to her two sons, especially Azubair, the younger one. You know, she spent her time trying to raise them to be men. And being that she came from a wealthy tribe, a wealthy family, money wasn't no problem for her. And so she was able to devote her time to her sons. She wanted them to be tough. Because as I tell you guys all the time, in this era of history, only the strong survived. If you were weak, you wouldn't have made it in the sixth, seventh, eighth century. Only the strong. Her youngest son, Azubair, he wasn't as strong as his older brother. Sometimes he would come home complaining to his mother of how the other kids bullied him. She would get angry. She would admonish him and she would tie him up and beat him to make him strong. And by the way, guys, this was very common. If you learn history, Google through how life was in the sixth, seventh and eighth century, boys had to be made strong. The Arabs would do this, the Vikings, the Vikings, you know what they would do to a boy who wasn't strong enough? They'd strip him of all his clothes and make him uh, a stand in an icy lake of water for as long as he could. So this was common, okay? Very common. They would beat the boy to make him tough, to make him not be a crybaby. The Romans, they would send their boys out hunting, hunting for lions, tigers, wolves, and they better come back with a wolf or with a tiger skin. So this was common back in those days. This was not oppressive. This was not a child abuser. This was the way the world was then. So when Azubair would come home crying, she'd tie him up and whip him to, to toughen him up. One day when she was whipping him, one of the members of her husband's family, remember her husband had died. He happened to walk by and saw her whipping her son. And he said, can't you be a little bit nicer to him? Remember, he's an orphan. You know, his father died because in Islam, a child is an orphan if he has no father. He said, his father's not here. So let the boy, can you give him a break? She told him, don't tell me how to raise my son. She said, I'm going to make a man out of him. I'm going to make him grow up to be a man who will never be defeated by anyone else. He will be a man who will never surrender to any of a lost creatures. That's how tough she was. And that's what she really was doing. We have this authentic hadith, and you'll find this hadith in Sahih Muslim. It's reported 
that one day when Azubair was older, he got into a duel with somebody who slandered him and tried to tease him. Azubair was so strong that he broke the man's hand and beat him up almost to the point of killing him. Now, Sophia was not just a warrior, but just like most women back then, most women back then also were nurses. They would also help take care of the sick. When this man was beaten up, he was taken to Sophia for her to nurse him. She said, oh my God, what happened to him? And they told her, your son, Azubair did this to him. And when they told her that, she smiled and she began to recite the following poem. She said, now tell me, how did you find Zubair? Did you find him like a cottage cheese? Or did you find him to be like a date fruit? Or did you find him to be like a falcon? He is not as simple to overcome or beat as easy food that can be eaten effortlessly. So in other words, she was saying, yeah, y'all talked about how I was too harsh on him. Y'all complained that I was abusing him too much. Now look at my son. Look at my son. He's undefeatable. SubhanAllah. And that's what she wanted. She always wanted him to grow up to be strong in body and in soul. This is a warrior. She was a warrior. Okay. Azubair, he grew up and guess what guys, we talked about him in another class, he accepted Islam before her. Sophia didn't, didn't embrace Islam as quickly as um, uh, her friends did. She didn't embrace Islam like Khadijah did and like Um Ruman and them did. She stood upon the religion of her, her forefathers for a while. In fact, Azubair, when he became Muslim, he used to go to his mother and argue with her to try to convince her to convert. And it would bother her that he took on this new religion, but there was nothing she could do to make him change his mind because he was now a man. And by the way, I want y'all to look at this picture. This is a picture that I dug up off the internet. This is how the women dressed back in the seventh, the sixth and seventh and eighth century. The Arabic women, because they were warriors, they had to fight. They wore hooded cloaks like this, okay? Hooded cloaks like this and they had uh, their swords and stuff attached to them. So that's why I picked this picture to give y'all an idea. And this is also how other women, the Roman women dressed similar to this too. And so did the Persians and the Vikings too, but the Vikings had wool because it was colder where they were. But this is how the women had to roll back then because you never knew when you was gonna be attacked. And Sophia was a horsewoman. She could work with horses, okay? So Sophia, ready Allahu on her, she did not embrace Islam for a while. In fact, she did not embrace Islam until the day her brother Hamza did. When Hamza came back into Mecca and heard that his nephew was a prophet, he accepted it. And when she heard that her brother accepted Islam, that's when she accepted it too, because her and Hamza were close. Just like when I did the story of Um Salama. Um Salama and Khalid bin Walid were first cousins. They were like brother and sister. Um Salama was trained with Hamza. That's how the girls were. The girls were trained 
with the men because again, the women had to know how to defend themselves. So just like Hamza, I mean, like uh, um, Um Salam and Khalid bin Walid were trained together. So was Sophia and Hamza. And there was a closeness that developed. There was a closeness that would develop between the woman and who she trained with. Sophia was very close to Hamza as Um Salama was very close to Khalid bin Walid, okay? So when Hamza converted to Islam, uh, she said, well, it must be true. She converted to. And there's a lot of hadiths that are mentioned about uh, how uh, good a person, good a woman Sophia uh, was. But the thing that I want to focus on, she had a lot of good characteristics. But what I chose to focus on, I want to focus on the warrior aspect of her because I am so sick and tired of Western women, you Western women thinking that Arabic women were pushovers. You Western women allowing the men to come to your countries and feed you garbage about being a woman that's not true. Making you think that women served no purpose, we're invisible. Muslim women were never invisible. Sophia was never invisible, just like Um Salama was never invisible. Neither was Aisha, neither was Hafsa, neither was Khadija. Okay? And what I'm going to focus on first for you guys is the Battle of the Trench. And by the way, you will find all these hadiths that speak about her in Bukhari, in Muslim, Muwatta, Termiti, they're in all the Siddha. But the ones I'm mentioning can be found in Bukhari, Muslim, and Muwatta. Okay? So during the Battle of the Trench, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you guys remember, um, 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 Mukhtar talked about it with you guys. When the Battle of the Trench occurred, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, had the trench built around uh, Medina. And he had the women and children put inside a fortress to protect them from the Quraysh and the Quraysh Jews. Now, Sophia was a warrior. She was angry. She didn't like being put in no fortress. Neither did Um Salama. Neither did any of the women. I'm gonna be honest. None of the women liked being put in that fortress because they had been used to being on the battlefield fighting before Islam. Before Islam, they were always on the battlefield. But now here comes the, the, the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, giving women rights which are good. But what comes around with comes along with those rights is the man's gonna protect you now. So anyway, the women were put in this fortress known as Fari, and the Prophet appointed Hassan ibn Thabit. He appointed Ibn Thabit to look after the women. In fact, he told him, do not join the fight. Your job is to stand outside the fortress and guard the women. Listen to what Sophia said. She tells us this in her own words, and you can find this hadith in Bukhari. She said, when the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went out to the battle of the trench, he put the women of his family in a fortress called Fari, and he assigned Hassan ibn Thabit to look out after us. A Jewish man walked by, and he climbed the fortress until he saw us in there. So I yelled out. I said, Hassan, Hassan, come and kill this man. But Hassan wouldn't. He said, no, the prophet told me to just watch you women and not do anything else. So I stood up, I grabbed my sword 
and I took off his head. She took her sword and cut the man's head off. And after she cut his head off, she told Hassan, she said, Hassan, I've killed him. Take his head and drag it to the Jews so they can see that we are armed in here. So they can see what, what fate they will meet if they try to come through this window. But again, Hassan Ibn Thabit swore by Allah that he wouldn't do it because the prophet told him to just stand guard. So Sophia said, I picked up his head that I took off his shoulders and I threw it out the window at the Jews. And when the Jews saw the head of their man come falling down upon them, they said, wow, this man would never leave his family without someone to guard them. So what did they do? They ran away. This is a warrior. This is a warrior. So where, what, where do you Muslim women in America and the United Kingdom and the West of the world think that Arabic women are these lick the pus people. And by the way, I want y'all to take a look at this picture here. This is another picture that I dug up off the internet. Not only did the women fight with swords, but I want y'all to look what's on her hands. There's a lot of uh, tombs and graves that they uncover and they would find this sharp stuff on the woman's nails. Look at this. The women, the Arabic women, would sh take pieces of uh, metal and sharpen them. And they would put them on their fingers. And they would use it to stab a man. That's how warriorish these women were. They were warriors. Okay? Warriors. warriors in the way of Allah. Like I said, Arabic women were never invisible. Muslim women are not invisible. Subhana Allah. So this shows how Sophia, may Allah be pleased with her. She had strong character, strong personality. She was indeed a true warrior of Allah. She didn't fear anyone or anything but a law. And she stepped up to the plate when the man wouldn't. Hello. Also, she not only served a great uh, service there, but listen to what happened. I'm sure you guys remember what happened at, at the Battle of Uhud. On the day of the Battle of Uhud, she had more than one remarkable uh, uh, input, input. Again, she was never invisible. When the people felt defeated because the archers had left their spot, she moved forward. Listen to what uh, Urwa says, and this hadith is authentic too, Bukhari and Muslim. He says, Sophia came forward on the day of the Battle of Uhud while the Muslims were vanquished. She came forward holding a spear in her hand and she began to strike the faces. See, she was a fighter, a warrior. She began to hit the faces of the polytheists with her sword. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw her, he called out to her son, to, to, to grab her because he loved her. That was his auntie. And he was afraid that she might get hurt. But when Sophia heard that her brother Hamza, whom she loved dearly, was killed, there was no stopping her. She wanted to see his dead body. So she grabbed her sword ran out on the battlefield, striking down every man that came in her way. And when she stood over her fallen brother and saw how he was mutilated, how his stomach was cut open, how his nose and ears were cut off, 
She said, uh, that's when Zubair told her mother, mother, go back. The prophet said, go back. That's when she told her son, subhanAllah. She said, why should I leave and go back when my brother has been mutilated in the way of Allah? We are not pleased with what has happened, but I will bear this with patience and I hope to get the reward from Allah. And so then she went back. And this is when the archers, guys, that's when the archers abandoned their post. Remember during the battle of Uhud? They abandoned their post and ran out to the battlefield trying to seek the spoils of war. And they left the prophet Muhammad standing alone with no protection. It was Um Umara, another woman. I'm going to do her story next week. Um Umara and her sons ran out to protect him. And Sophia ran out with a sword and a javelin. And they surrounded the prophet and dared anyone to come near him until Abu Bakr and Ali joined. So she played two great roles during the battle of Buhud. And they tell you that the Muslim women didn't participate in battles. How did they skip over these hadiths? These hadiths are in Bukhari and Muslim. How did they skip over them? Okay. Her and Um Amara, they surrounded the prophet. She had a sword and a javelin and she dared anyone. She was already upset with the murder of her brother. She dared any of them to come near the prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Also, Sophia was present when the prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though she was very attached to her nephew, her faith remained strong. But she did say this about him at his death. She said, Many occurrences have taken place after you. If you were alive and had been witness to them, calamities would not have reached such a proportion. You see, this is what she said uh, uh, after he had died, when the fitna began. Because remember, after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, that's when the Muslims began all this fitna and stuff. So she said, many occurrences have happened after you. If you were living and had witnessed them, this stuff wouldn't have happened. Also, we have a hadith where she said, the day we miss the prophet is here. Oh, eyes shed tears. The day of your death is certainly a day in which the sun is wrapped up in darkness through its shining. And all the historians of Islam say that this is, these are the words that she said. You know, this is after his death, when, this, when times got bad, okay? Sophia, radiallahu anha, the aunt of the prophet, the sister of Hamza, she lived until the caliphate of Umar. Nobody knows for sure when she died, but she died sometime during uh, the caliphate of Umar. So she witnessed a lot of stuff. She witnessed a lot of, 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 of things happen. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, she made uh, those statements. She would often be heard making statements like that. If my nephew were here still, then none of this would happen, okay? All right, so that's the story. I'm putting the PowerPoint down so y'all can see me. That's the story of Sophia, ready Allahu anha, the aunt of the Prophet Muhammad. And again, when y'all hear these famous men talking about Muslim women, you know, being invisible, ask them what Muslim women. You tell them because if you look at the history of Islam, there is nothing, there were Muslim women involved in everything. They were involved with every battle. They were involved at the mosques. There is no, no chapter of any hadith that's not book that doesn't mention something about the Muslim women. They were active. 
So why is it that these men today want you Western women to think that you're supposed to be invisible? Maybe you women will be invisible. Layla Nasheba will never be invisible. All right. I'm going to stop right here. Supana kala huma wa hamdika. A shadow on Laila haila anta. A stock feruka wa tuboy lake. Are there any questions or comments? No comment, but uh, just a little comment. I just knew she was supposed to get it, get it cracking when she when she went and seen her brother. I was like, oh, she supposed to get it cracking. Mm -hmm. I thought she was supposed to say she supposed to start taking all the heads. But yeah, I knew she, it was, yeah, she was a warrior. Like I said, these Arabic women back in those, and not just the Arabic women, they, all the women that live, th those were rough times in history. All the people trained there, the women that they kept alive. Remember, they used to kill the girl babies. The ones that lived, they felt were special. So they had to train them in how to defend themselves. And like I said, the ones that weren't defended, that couldn't be trained, they, they knew about poison. You want to know who was big on poison? I love Persian history. Woo! The women of Persia. Woo, 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 woo. That's who took out Alexander the Great. Who took out Alexander the Great? That Persian woman that he took on with his sodomite self. She fed him that poison. Yeah, poison was a big thing back in those days. And the women were the ones that wielded it, the ones that couldn't fight. They knew how to, they always carry poison in their sleeve or, or, or something. Because you never know when you got to use it. Charm a dude, slip it in his drink and let him die. That's what happened to Alexander the Great. He got taken out by a woman. Poison. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments, guys? Yeah, I don't know why these brothers skip over these hadiths with y'all in America. I mean, in the West, Arab women know their history and they're proud of their history. It's just these Western women. Y'all keep on covering your bodies up, wearing those niqabs and thinking that you can't be beautiful. Y'all keep on being that way. I mean, ain't nothing wrong with a niqab, but some of my sister-in-law wears niqab and she's Arabic, but I'm saying some of y'all wear it because y'all were told that you can't be beautiful. I don't, I, I don't understand how y'all let people tell you that junk because these women weren't walking around in no niqabs and, 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 and all that dumb stuff. I showed y'all that's real common. They shape that stuff up like a knife. Tiger. That's like the ones the the ladies with the when on on those movies like them Chinese ladies they, they had those fingers like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Chinese women. Now that's another culture. Another oh my god, I love the history of the Chinese women. Oh my god, those women were trained to charm you. They didn't. They fought too, but they were masters of seduction. They were trained to seduce you and then take you out. They knew how to play the game of being your concubine or letting you think you're getting ready to have your way with them. Then they take you out. Yeah, that the 6th, 7th, and 8th century. I had to study that a lot when I was in college getting my degree. I, and I, it, it fascinated me to see what, what the extremes the women had to go through. And like I tell y'all, history repeats itself. The world goes around and around. It's filled with up and down roller coasters, but it used to be before Islam without any rights, prostituted just a piece of meat and we see it happening today i see it happening with a lot of you sisters that's why i'm so devout to my dawah 
because it makes me sad to hear Muslim women ask me questions like, do I have to be ugly? Is it true that I have to pretend that I'm invisible? What? Who told you that? The brother said that I have to pretend that I don't exist, that I'm of no worth. What? What? Huh? Where is y'all getting this from? So you can see it's already happening. Men are stripping you sisters down, taking y'all back to that, that piece of meat stage. And that's sad because those women hated it. They hated being treated that way. They hated it. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad. That's why I don't have that many followers too, because I'm teaching y'all the truth. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Tomorrow is Thursday, right? Because uh, we got the Q&A on Friday. And tomorrow I do have, I'm looking at this, I got an appointment. But my appointment, alhamdulillah, is not until, um, it's in the morning. So I'll be here. Tomorrow we have the 6 o'clock class. Make sure you guys continue with chapter 8 of the book, Diluting Well I Will Better. Continue with chapter eight. And for those of you who have not yet purchased the book, please get it. Go to amazon.com. Let me put that name up here. Okay, the sister, you want to know the name? Yeah, here it is. Hold on. I got a thing for it. Give me a second. Didn't I, I do have a tab thing for it. Hold on. Let me find it. Let me find it. I don't have nobody to work my TV. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. I got so much stuff on here, y'all. I can't. I, when, it's at the bottom, I think. Layla, go down. Here it is. Oh, that ain't it. Who is that? Oh, don't forget, guys, Dr. Jamali. Don't let me forget to uh, stream him. Uh, he will be doing the kutbah in Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid's mosque on Friday. I got that written in here. Y'all hear me? Sabrine, somebody? Yeah. Sabrine, I will. If okay, yeah. 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 Don't let he's doing a coot by Friday at Sheikh Kareem Abu Zayd's mosque. And it's gonna be at there, there's two hours. Uh it'll be two o'clock my time. Remind me that he is a different, a time difference. I cannot here it is. But this is the book. There the name of it is. Guys, make sure you go to Amazon.com and purchase the book, Diluting Well I Well Better, Volume 2, by Sheikh Karim Abouze, because we'll be starting that book next week, inshallah. It's 1999. And also, make sure you guys buy this book, the book of Sheikh Atlee's. Where is Sheikh Atlee's book? Don't I have it? Oh, I don't. I think I got his as a... Sheikh Atlee's book, I got a picture of it. Hold on. This is, okay. There it is. This is Sheikh Atlee's book. Wait a minute, let me move this out the way. The Articles of Belief. Can y'all see it at the top? Go to www.atleeonline.com. Let me move that out the way. Hold on. There it is www.adleyonline.com. Go there and order the book entitled The Articles of Belief. This book is just $10. The Articles of Belief by Sheikh Atley. That $10 is the shipping and everything. For those of you who live in, the, in Canada or outside of America, he has the ebook. The ebook is only a dollar something. Get the articles of belief because I'm going to start that book after next week, too. And we that book is important because um, we need to review the first part of that Shahada. Remember, I got Muslims sitting up in here thinking it's going to be Christians in paradise. That's some serious Akita issues. Y'all know that. You can't sit there and say you believe la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dora Rasulullah, but Allah uh, made a mistake when he said that uh, there will be no other religion but Islam. How can you say something like that? Okay. 
So we will be discussing that. We have to review those um, uh, pillars, articles of faith. I got a lot of Muslims that don't understand the articles of faith. So we have to review it. Allah lets you know, anyone, what does he say? Anyone who dies upon a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted. That's in the Quran. Anyone who dies upon a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of you. So how can you say you believe la ilaha illallah, but you don't believe that? We're messed up. That's the story of the Muslims. That's the story of the Muslims. Hello. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Y'all got the books, right? Oh, what is this? Hold on, Hold on for a second. Okay. All right. Okay, so inshallah, guys, uh, read the rest of chapter eight in diluting well or well better. And then also tomorrow we have my hadith class. And then uh, don't forget Friday is the Q&A. Any questions you have, you can bring them here on Friday. And uh, I'm going to close out for right now so I can get comfortable with myself here at home. Supana kala huma wa bihamdika ashadu anla ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Y'all have a